What's up, family? So today we're going to be discussing sitcoms. I was sitting there and I had this thought. I was just wondering, you know, this is a this is a hot topic here. It's a it's an old hot topic, but it's still a hot topic about all of the sit the sitcoms and the the black sitcoms. Do you think they were golden or not? Because I thought they were. And what I always like um, about black sitcoms, and not only just black sitcoms, any sitcom back in the 60s and 70s and 80s or 90s, what I always liked about the sitcoms were they they taught you a valuable lesson. They showed you which way to go. That's why I felt like they were um, golden. Even with Andy Griff, Andy and Griffin, you know, um, when that little boy would go out there and get into something and father would have to show him something or House on the Prairie, you know, when them girls would go out, the Mingle Woods would go out there and get mixed up in something and father, Landrum, oh, that was my man. But if I wanted to marry a white man, that was him. I always felt like um, sitcoms were golden. But these sitcoms that they uh, that they throw up on you now, they push stuff in your face. They make you eat it. They make you accept it. They make you take that. Now you got to monitor things and make sure it's okay for your kids to watch. And they got it where they damn near know when you take a break. You could be sitting there with your child, and they, they, they kind of know when you get tired. When you go to get some popcorn out uh, and, and put it in the microwave, folks, it's pumping. You know, so I want to talk about these sitcoms because I had a lot of black sitcoms that I liked it. But when they start changing, you know, I start changing with them. My intuition let me know it, it's time to get up. This, this ain't what's happening. So I found something. PW Entertainment was golden age of the '90s black sitcoms actually golden. Make sure my volume down because I don't want no strikes. All right. So we we uh we just off right now. We we uh studying, we in the lab. You know, a lot of times I like to come to the lab and lately I haven't been in the lab with y'all, but I'm always in the lab. But but let's talk about these sitcoms. Was the golden age of 90s black sitcoms actually golden? This piece is part of a franchise called Is a Throwback, where we celebrate the golden age of black TV. Why well, I keep getting all these pop-ups? From the best 90s sitcom to Disney Channel classics, it's time to tune back into the shows that shaped our identities. Now, let me say this. Even with a kid, like I said, I've, I've been psychic. Before. I was psychic in my mother's womb. I was psychic before mother called me and I had to come to the earth. I It was always something about Disney. I couldn't get into Disney. I watched a little Nickelodeon and a little Nickelodeon here at night, but I couldn't get with Disney. But now... With all the things that come out, and Orlando Brown and That's So Raven, I didn't even get into those things. Now I understand why I didn't like Disney. I couldn't, I couldn't, they had lost me a long time ago with this stuff. For as long as I can remember, I've been putting 90s black sitcoms on a pedestal. If anyone stepped to me with a negative opinion about any of my favorite classics, I took it very personal and made a point to lecture them about their impact. Because quite frankly, these shows were my window to black joy. The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, Martin, and Family Matters, now, let me say this. I watch um, Fresh Pinch of Bel-Air, but I wasn't really a fan of Wheels. I was more a fan of Jeffries. And sometimes I was a fan of Aunt Vibs, and I couldn't get with old girl that was stuck up. 
You know what I'm saying? I when I watch Fritz Fresh Prince of Bel Air, I gravitate gravitated to Steve Urkel because he made me laugh. He made me laugh all the time. And I was, I'm a character. He was a character. I gravi I gravitated to him. I gravitated to Laura, you know, and I gravitated, gravitated to the girl that died of breast cancer on there. There were certain characters. And then, what was the black guy's name that was clueless about everything? I gravitated to him but then again, I was shamed because he reminded me of who I really, I, who I really am. He held up a, a mirror and showed me that I was really Waldo, who I had been running from. But I, but now, um, entering into my fifties in a few years from here, I am Waldo, and I gravitated to the baby that they cut off because I'm the baby in my family, you know, but. Some of those characters I couldn't get into, you know. So I I like Family Matters, but there were certain characters that I gravitated to on Family Matters. But back on topic. For as long as I can remember, I've been putting 90s black sitcoms on a pedestal. If anyone stepped to me with a negative opinion about my favorite classics... I took it very personally and made a point to lecture them about their impact because, quite frankly, these shows were my, were my windows to black joy. The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air slash Martin and family members are just a few that kept me crackling when I needed, when, when I needed a pick-me-up, not to mention my unhealthy obsession with certain characters. Was I the only one who harbored a secret crush on Stefan Urkel? Still, despite my love for these iconic shows, there's one particular question that's been nagging me thanks to a recent discussion with a friend. As we talked about the rise and the sudden fall of these black shows at the new millennium, I considered them... Some of my favorite temporary contemporary shows like Abbott Elementary and Blackish, both of which decept the black experience in a more realistic and compelling way, and just how good they really are. I couldn't help but wonder why did the nineties golden age of black TV come to an end? Was the world just not ready for it? They might have not been because it was plenty of wisdom. Or did these shows actually get nixed because they weren't as good as I remember? The thought alone left me unsettled. I mean, could nostalgia really clouded my judgment that much? Eager to get to the bottom of this, I did a little digging to figure out the real reason these classics suddenly fell off per New York Times. From 1997 to 2001, the number of black sitcoms on TV in U.S. dropped from 15 to 6. And sadly, it had a lot to do with declining viewership of ratings in his 2001 article, Robert F. Mose wrote, Advertisers crave the biggest, most affluent audience they can get in practice of predominantly white audience. Whereas the breakthrough Norman Lee shows of the 1970s, Sanford and Son, baby, that's my thing. I, I'm going to show you all my Sanford and Son collection once I get it together. Good Times and the Jeffersons attracted a big multiracial following, and in the 1980s, the Cosby Show ruled the airwaves. Today's black sitcoms have been unable to un been unable to achieve crossover status. He added, "The Parkers currently, which I didn't watch at all, the Parkers currently the highest rated African American show has a viewership." of about 5 million 
primarily in black homes, less than half of the numbers posted by Dharma and Greg. What is all of this stuff? So I got so many pop-ups. So it turns out that even the most popular black sitcoms couldn't compete with more mainstream shows thanks to having smaller targeted audience. But this wasn't the only reason Dr. Robin R. Means Coleman, Vice President and Associate Provost in Diversity and in Inclusion at Northern Northwestern University told Refinery29 that it also had a lot to do with networks attempting to profit off of black content without paying much attention to the quality of these shows. Whew. Ah, here came the nagging feeling again. Following the, set, following the success of the Cosby show, which brought in a fairly diverse audience, the 90s saw an influx of new black sitcoms that tried to appeal to both black and non-black viewers, Coleman said. In the 90s, executives wanted to capitalize on the young white audience. Which could that be Michael J. Fox? But we'll keep going. I could take this to the spiritual realm, but I'm not. Want to capitalize off of young white audiences that were tuning into the Cosby show. They thought, hey, let's get these viewers with disposable income to tune in to the to the Fresh Prince of Bel Air. However, the more black sitcoms that got introduced, the more quality seemed to plummet. Instead of introducing black comedians with substance, they tackled deeper topics. Networks continued to release more cappy black sitcoms like Eve and Homeboys in outer space, which left desperate attempts to What's this? I M I A T E. Initiate a successful business model. I don't even know what them shows was. Coleman said it was more about quality, quantity than quality, and an effort for networks to cash in and make money. Of course, once the trend died down, they abandoned the black shows, and it's. And it's been over a decade since they were anything like that. Now, to be fair, not that all of these sitcoms were tame surface-level comedians that filtered out messier parts of black experience. They were, of course, a, there was, of course, a different world which gave viewers a taste of Greek life. A historically black college explored controversial topics and introduced layers, characters like the fabulous Whitney Gilbert. Then there was Living Single, which spoke to value maintaining a deep, meaningful friendship as a black young adult. I didn't watch too much of Living Single, and the only reason why I did watch a few of it was because uh, Queen Latifah was in it. Black Panther. But anyway. These examples... Wait a minute. Let me make sure I didn't skip something. These examples aside, as I continue to dig into this, I couldn't help but to get a little defensive about my favorite lighthearted classics. Think the Wayne's Brothers. I watched the Wayne's Brothers... I'm telling you, they start getting it start getting a little sugary in some of this stuff. Let me let me let me shut up. These examples aside, as I continue to dig into this, I couldn't help but to get a little defensive about my favorite lighthearted classes. Think the Wayans brothers, the Jamie Foxx show. I didn't watch. I watched about three episodes, about three little shows. The Smart Guy and Martin, sure, a lot of them weren't necessarily the most nuanced or layered. 
Even writer Kyle Hiller argued in his article for Pace that the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, a major success for NBC, was more or less a Bollywood plate of the Cosby Show, a younger audience from a network desperate for a hit. But nuisanced or not, the sitcoms helped pave the way for a for quite a few com- co- comedians on TV today as delivered genuine laugh-out-loud moments, whether it was the sight of Pam throwing bunches at a wild animal on Martin or Jamie going to ridiculous lengths to win over the fancy to win over Fancy on Jamie Foxx show. Shouldn't this trailblazing quality alone be enough to paint them as part as something more than golden? There's nothing more quite like these shows on television today. But perhaps that's okay. As much as I don't like, as much as I don't think, most of them would hold up today Maybe that's beside the point. As with any other genre, comedy TV has evolved. One look at today's most successful sitcoms will tell you that there's less emphasis emphasis on slapstick humor and more on realistic. Throughout storylines, the challenge viewers and, and make them laugh. The most successful comedy show features multidimensional characters, explore bizarre concepts, and even blur the lines between comedy and other genres. Be it drama, thriller, mystery, or sci-fi, but most importantly, these shows bring something new to the table as opposed to offering formality storylines that feel a little bit too familiar. One standout example is ABC's brilliant sitcom Blackish, the first black comedy to air on network television in over five years. In the show, creator Kena Barris offered a refreshing take on black experience in America as seen throughout the lenses of dysfunctional upper middle class black family. Dre insists on lecturing his kids about black history to remind them of their roots and Bao shares countless awkward moments with her kids as she tries to connect them. Meanwhile, the jokes and references are seriously funny and always timely and not every episode concludes with neatly polished moral of the story. Another great example, Issa's Raises Insecure, which follows two black females, best females, as a negative, their quote-unquote very complicated personal relationship and careers. In this case, fans got to see the world through the eyes of Issa, known for her rapping skills and next-level awkwardness and code-switching Pro Molly, who could never catch a break in dating, in, who could never catch a break in the dating world. These series explore several important themes, from toxic masculinity to gentrification, while balancing humor with the most intense drama. Quote: Don't get us started on Issa and Molly's fight. Unquote. The series was groundbreaking in the way that it embrace imperfectionists and amplify the voices of black America. Is this to say the 90s golden age of black sitcoms was, wasn't was golden after all? Well, yes and no. I will say nostalgia has a huge part to play when it comes to how I view the classes today. And it was incredible to see television networks make progress in terms of representation. However, many of these shows felt like reinterpretations of the same formula and given of the same formula 
and given how many of them were canceled in a short time span, it didn't take long for viewers to catch on. Fortunately, through we're in the golden age of streaming, which means more binge-worthy, diverse content. Highlights, Black Stories, Stephanie Troutman, Rogers, and a scholar at University of Arizona explained in an interview, with the influx of capable networks and digital platforms such as Netflix, there are more, there are more opportunities for people to engage with different and more complex stories about the black experience and for black people to find a reflection of themselves and their communities on TV. Y'all watch Netflix. I don't I, I don't even have Netflix. The scholar even touched on how deception of black people on the screen has involved. Robins continue. We're seeing more of very rich landscape of blackness in the United States, including variations according to sexuality, social economic, economic status, and geographical location. Shows like the Chi, whatever the Chi is, created by Lena Waithe and Insecure, create created by. Isaac Ray, honey, I thought they were about to say Isaac Hayes. Now, you know I was finna pay my $13 for Isaac Hayes. And even Pose, I don't know what Pose is, I've heard about it, where family is defined as chosen rather than purely biological and particularly black communities, including the LGBT community are centered. Knowing that there are so many more compelling black shows that go beyond 90s humor is definitely something worth celebrating, which now begs the question, have we moved on into a new golden age? So given the increase in more intense and through provoking dramedies like Insecure, Netflix, Dear White People, and FXA's Atlanta, and then, of course, there are there are lighthearted but highly nuanced opinions or options like ABC's Abbott Elementary and Netflix the Upshaws. But here here's the thing: a part of me will always be drawn to quirky family members. I made that up. But here's the thing: a part of me will always be drawn to the quirky family friendly black sitcom, no matter how predictable. So yes, I will watch every single episode of Abbott Elementary, whatever the hell that is. But I will also continue to watch Sean and his dim-witted brother stumble into messy situations on the Wayans Brothers. You bet. Y'all say what y'all want. Ain't nothing like Sanford and Son. Ain't nothing like the Cosby. Ain't nothing like Family Matters. I even watched, what was that, Stand Out All Night Long? I watched about four or five of them and would laugh all night long, and I didn't watch much of that. Them, them black stories, they they can say what they, want, what they want, but them black stories told you what to stay out of and told you not what to, what to do and what not to do, and Tia and Tamara, the... They, black folks paved the way, but like I said, white people did too, because I watched, like I said, Little House on the Prairie, you know what I'm saying, for, for a lecture, when I need to learn something, I watched Andy Griffin, and when I want to party and have a good time, I watched Benny Hill, oh, that man, when I wanted some, 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 when I wanted some porn, I watched Benny Hill run through, run through that neck, and with some black socks on, and some cardboard. 